So, welcome to the second session. Um, I don't know much about our next speaker, I must admit, admit, but I'm intrigued by his topic, a survey. What an impossible challenge, yeah? A survey of legal pluralism uh, in, and religion-based personal laws in Europe. Um, given that we have so many countries and so many systems that claim to be secular and to be regulating all sorts of things in different ways. Yeah? I'm really looking forward to hear what you have to say about this. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I've said uh, to him and to the next speaker that we will have a joint discussion in a moment after both presentations, otherwise things will go out of control, I fear. Yeah? Um, so, so, over thank, to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first, you, of, you're just speaking, yeah? You don't have a. No, okay, no, no, I'll stay here. I okay. traditional <laughs> presentation. Yeah. Okay. Want uh, slides? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation at this uh, conference. Uh, I will start my consideration with. Uh, simple questions, also whether the answer is very, very difficult uh, to find. Or rather, in a society of uh, many religions, what is the best law to apply for governation the religious pluralism? To try to respond to these uh, questions, I will try to reflect on three keywords. Territoriality, one. Translation, two. And interculturality, three. The first question, custom and territoriality. There is no doubt that the dialect between personal law and the territorial law recalls concept of space. It does so in two ways, in the material sense, through the geographical area where the law is applied, as well as in the values and the morals, ethics, politics, and religions that come together to define a legal system. Consequently, factors that exist outside of these areas are potential disturbance to the their possible incompatibility with the lex cause and the lex fori. Over time, courts have become the main arbitrators dealing with the movement of regulatory models and the openings and the closing of internal legal system to international laws. Conflict of laws, weakened public order, and the new justification in criminal law all contribute to the opening of a system for foreign law, but above all they hollow for the observation of judges' attitudes towards religious laws. The approach to this is often contradictory and conditional on a number of external factors, such as the relationship between the state and religions, the degree of evaluation that confessional law has undergone by religious authority, and the degree to which religious law has been contaminated by the secular legal culture. Indeed, it cannot be denied that in Christ the force of a state to accommodate religious norms in its system improves the outcome of cases where it has previously, previously been impossible to reach some sort of an agreement with the minority confessional party. As illustrated, the Spanish case concerning the agreement approved in 1992 between the Spanish government 
and the Spanish Islamic Commission. Similarly, it's likely that the judges will be more open to the personal laws of a religion nature if they have been subject to reinterpretation when compared to new generation of fundamental rights within the religious community. To illustrate such a point, it's useful to consider the European Muslim Charter, signed in Brussels in 2008 by over 400 European Muslim Association. At number nine, it states, Islam respect human rights and the calls for equality among all human begins. It rejects all form of racial discrimination and emphasizes the importance of freedom. In Christ's acceptance of the integration of personal religious laws leads to connection within the European social political context, particularly when in results in variation of methods of religious interpretation. This can be seen in the Muslim community with the replacement of the Dar al-Harb strong formula in the classification of immigration land with less confrontational expression such as Dar al-Had or Dar al Sol. In this context, Europe is no longer classified as a land of war, but rather as a land of conciliation and agreement, where one can live and practice culture peaceful, peaceful, peacefully and in harmony with the values in the European culture. As uh, number one of the chapter reads, when interpreting the religious laws contained within the Holy Quran and the Sunnah, one must consider the specifics of the European reality. The questions remain as to how European judges have reacted. It seems that the two as law guidelines have been consolidated over time. On the one hand, the judicial authority posed with the task of dealing with challenges that arise out of religious plurality has been able to respond in an inclusive manner, allowing for the application and acceptance of personal laws particularly with regards to family law. This is easier to achieve in cases where the religious authority has definitively accepted the fundamental legal principle of the Western state. Where with has occurred the conflict of laws rules provided for by international private law are active date not just as technical means of coordination, but as integration instrument. This is demonstrated in the Italian Supreme Court ruling 1739 on 1999, in which a polygamous marriage was legally recognized only for the purpose of applying inheritance laws. It's evident that a similar method of interpretation increases the change of including personal law issues in the national legal system, allowing for the resolution of conflicts that exist between the rules in a more harmonious, harmonious manner. Such inclusivity doesn't alter where the coexistence of rule is perceived differently. In these cases, a defensive logic is applied. The value attributed to a national identity 
is greater and is considered the dominant criteria is resolving legal dispute. This result is a closing of the interpretative doors in favor of the lex cause. This mainly occurs in two situations and in for the most part in reference to Islamic interpretation. When gender equality is at risk, at when there is a risk of multicultural legal shift that would undermine the legal unity of the nation states. The European Commission has responded to a parliamentary interrogation dealing with a quick divorce that was denied by the German courts commenting. Gender equality is a fundamental right and a common value of the European Union. Laws or practices that discriminate against the women are inacceptable. With the 1998 report on Islam and the European Averroes Day, the Parliament invited the Member States to enhance mutual understanding of the cultures and civilization in Mediterranean society and condemned all forms of discrimination against the women, requesting that all the European Union states, with the cooperation of Islamic nations, promote equal opportunities between men and women. It's uh, thus evident the European institution reject all form of cultural and religious relativism which could violate women's fundamental rights, confirming the validity of human rights for all which constitute a universal, universal patrimony that the West has accumulated and which are required by the weakest to build a richer, freer, and a more complete life. The non-application or violation of, of human rights on European soil by ethnic and cultural groups who don't identify with such rules would result in the application of a system of personal laws irreconcilable with the Western legal system in questions. It's for the same reason that the doctrine has continued to reiterate that the concept that personal statutes would be fatal to European legal system. It would mean reverting back centuries to a time of cuius regi re regio eius et religio, ruining the uniqueness and equality of the law for citizens. The request posed for the European Parliament for the formation of an area of non-application of national law in favor of Sharia's law is paradigmatic, as was applied by the Islamic courts in Britain. The question addressed in Parliament concerned the position Islamic law should have in the European Union and whether it has the ability to undermine the constitutional system of the member states, the fundamental rights of men and women and the same construction as Europe. The response handed down by the Commission was on the one hand elusive and on the other hand very clear in affirming that no decision issued by jurisdictions that are not in accordance with the Constitution laws of the member states can have a legal value. Such decisions cannot form the basis of any legal systems. It's up to, to authority of the member states to guarantee that the internal legal order is fully respected. The probable risk is clear 
a revival of the recognition of personal status through the use of private courts dealing with issue relative to personal laws could mean that the protection of such laws is remote from the state courts. Second key words, translation and understanding of the other legal system in Europe, the Italian case. The second key words in understanding the dynamics that exit between personal law and the territorial law concern the translation activity that European judges are increasingly obligated to complete for the application of lex causa. Translation is an intellectual operation that involves an understanding of the such a cultural context of where the foreign law was promulgated, but mostly it's an activity that requires an understanding of a different way of thinking and reasoning, as well as interpreting the cultural imagery that form the basis of a foreign law. In short, translating means forcing oneself, oneself to understand the difference. In other words, between us and them, there is no longer much of difference, rather all become part of a new we. The question is even more complex when it comes to the translation of legal principle and institutions. It's quite obvious that the translation has a huge influence of legal outcome, especially when it occurs, uh, occurs across different and contrasting cultures. The words in legal language are not emotionally neutral. Rather, often they provoke emotions and they often express a system of values. This is demonstrated in a ruling handed down by the Court of Aosta in 2011, with regards to a divorce decision for SICAC pronounced in 2004 by a Moroccan judge. In this case, the Italian, <coughs> the Italian judge simply translated the word SICAC as a revocable divorce, confusing the irre irrevocable divorce process implanted both by the man and the woman in condition of equality, with talak, the legal divorce transaction, which is uh, exercible by a man and always revoc revocable. In other words, as a result of a bad translation from Arabic to French, a confusion was created attributing the legal institution of divorce, SICAC, with the revocable aspect of talak. In this case, a few considerations should be made. One, it's clear that the decision of the court of Aosta is beside on a lack of uh, knowledge of Moroccan law, followed by a bad translation from Arabic into French, which confused the judge applying the lex cause. Two, this case demonstrates the prejudice behavior <coughs> of the judge when confronted with foreign laws outside the scope of the Western tradition. In, an, in interpreting a divorce as revocable, the extravagant nature of the concept was not considered, rather the exotic nature of the case and the irrationality of the foreign law in the context 
of the state legal system were taken as implicit. Three, the case prove that it is not always appropriate to translate. There are cases in which it would better to maintain the name of the legal concept who hand. The last consideration, not translating, would have avoided the use of a word such as reputation, which tends to prompt a feeling of aversion in Italian courts. The word talak would have caused less apprehension and elicited a less emotive response. An example of a situation in other culture where this has occurred is with the Jewish get towards which judges demonstrate less hostility and a larger interpretative equilibrium, despite the fact that the two concepts are similar. Three keywords. Interculturally, a new challenge. With a specific reference to Muslim law, it's undoubtedly important that state judges make an effort to understand it. In saying this, such an action is still for the most part unorganized and often amateur. What is missing is an intercultural approach to the law to evaluate the extent to which a legal system can support the weight of ethnically and religiously oriented rights in a prejudiced manner. In this sense, it's increasingly important that European legal culture instigate what Newman called the functional equivalent, the ability to interpret other cultures, principles, and communal values expressed in other languages and categories. This will force judges to develop methods of interpretation that are able to render different regulatory tradition and easily understood by the parties in the proceedings. This is an effort not in the, in the, <clears throat> not in the initial implementation, but rather in obtaining convincing the responses to the question of recognition and protection of the different ethnically and religiously strained members of the society. In order to de develop the intercultural perspective trough, which we can understand and grasp the dialectic between personal and the territorial law, it's fundamental to learn over to observe and the judge order in the same way in the which we judge ourselves. At the same time, we must learn to judge and observe ourselves through the light of others. In doing so, the connection between personal and national law will coalesce to create a bidirectional path creating an, an entirely new hybrid of Lex Fori and the Lex Cause. The challenge for the current regulatory system lies in translating, understanding, balancing, mediating and excluding, in facing such challenges, new ways of pluralism, pluralism will be formed to determine the future of pluralist democracies. Thank you so much.
Thank you for also keeping within time. Um, you set a very tough challenge for judges. I'm wondering to hear what uh, Marie Claire will say about that later. And I was wondering about Ilker, you know, when you said that things would be easily understandable by people involved in the process, you told us something different yesterday. Um, Michele, we should hear you now, and then we have a joint discussion. Yeah? Are you doing a PowerPoint, or? You will, okay. Are you? Uh, where's our young man? Who, oh, okay. We need the PowerPoint, please. The next one. Yeah. Uh, I presume that Professor Gradiaze doesn't need much introduction, and he was already introduced by Professor Tognati as one of the founders of big institutions here in uh, Italy. Uh, We've met quite a lot of times in Halle. <coughs> yes. Uh, so. But I'm not really part of the club. Uh, oh. Contrary to most of <laughs> most of the participants to this conference anyway. that deal regularly with law and religion, I am, uh, in a certain sense, an amateur in the field. So uh, I'm here as a comparative law lawyer. I wish to thank uh, uh, warmly. Roberto Tognatti for this invitation, which is a sign of friendship uh, for me. We have been in touch for a long time, although we we didn't work that often on on these type of topics. But then at a certain point, he realized that I was involved in it in a different uh, uh, <coughs> institution, and we resumed a conversation that was uh, um, always very lively uh, among us. So. Thank you also for the very enriching presentation that have taken place, uh, place uh, so far. I learned a lot and many themes returned. Roberto decided to assign to me this topic, uh, which is joining certain keywords, as Roberto said, that belong to the field of comparative law and then inserted into these uh, religion-based uh, personal laws that as far as Europe is concerned, apparently, I, uh, this, I was <laughs> confirmed in my view, don't have that much space in Europe, apparently. Don't uh, play a major role. So part of the title has to be dropped, but um, I decided to um, give you my honest view of the title, which is probably this one. When we talk about mixed legal systems, we are uh, speaking of legal systems that uh, evolve um, due to contacts with other legal systems. Um, and this often, happen, often happens uh, along a border, uh, be it a cultural border, an ethnical, ethnical border, or a territorial border. So. I took the liberty to simplify a little bit my topic. I'm not intending to you know, give you a lecture on mixed legal systems in comparative law, but rather, which would be found in any textbook by now, but rather to present some reflections and uh, uh, offer you my views of what the state of the art more or less is in this field. Now, I would say that there are three phases in this story concerning mixed legal systems. At first, probably, they were per se perceived as failed or destitute legal systems. Nothing was working really properly. And I will have a long citation, and I ask you to be patient and go over with me, um, uh, go over this citation with me. It was not a compliment to a legal system to observe that it was mixed, probably. Then we enter into a phase which is the rehabilitation of mixed legal systems. A literature um, becomes uh, more and more voluminous, and by now there are association of mixed jurisdictions and so on and so forth. And then the final phase, which is I try to capture, in a certain sense, we look all a little bit mixed nowadays. Uh, the feeling is that the differences are decreasing rather than increasing, and so on and so forth. But let's first 
try to observe these three phases. And I wish to introduce the first by a long citation taken from Alexis de Tocqueville. Everybody knows that Alexis de Tocqueville went to the United States of America and made uh, several pertinent observations that ended up in his uh, uh, splendid democracy in America. But few people know that he also went to Lower Canada, which is Quebec today. And he also took notes about Lower Canada. And one of his observations concerns a day in court in Lower Canada in 1831. And here is his report. Of course, it's translated into English. We came into a large hall divided into tires, crowded with people who seemed altogether French. The British arms were painted in full size on the end of the hall. Beneath them, there was the judge in robes and bands. The lawyers were ranked in front of him. When we came into the hall, a slander action was in process. It was a question of finding a man who had called another panda. In Italiano, probabilmente sarebbe pendaglio da forca, per, <laughs> per capirci. And Casse, stinker. The lawyer argued in English, panda, he said pronouncing the word with a thoroughly English accent, <coughs> meant a man who had been hanged. No, the judge solemnly <laughs> intervened, but who ought to be. <laughs> At that, the counsel for the defense got up indignantly and argued his case in French. His adversary answered in English. The argument works out on both sides in English, no doubt, without their understanding each other perfectly. From time to time, the Englishman forced himself to put his argument in French so as to follow his adversary more closely. The other did the same sometimes. The judge sometimes speak in French, sometimes English, and they were to keep order. The crier of the court called for silence, but also the English pronunciation of the word. The custom of Normandy was cited, reliance placed on Denisard, and mention was made of the decrees of Parliament of Paris and the statutes of, reign, of the reign of George III. After that, the judge granted that the word crasser implies that a man is without morality, he'll behaved and dishonorable, order the defendant to pay a fine of 10 louis or 10 pounds sterling. And here are the observations. The lawyers I saw there, who are said to be the best in Quebec, gave no proof of talent, either in the substance or in the manner of what they said. They were conspicuously lacking in distinction, speaking French with a middle-class Norman accent. Their style is vulgar and mixed, with odd idioms and English phrases. Entrez dans la boîte. <laughs> They shout to a witness, meaning that he should take his place in the witness box. <laughs> and here we come to the final conclusion. There is something odd, incoherent, even burlesque in the whole picture. But at the bottom, the impression made was one of sadness. Never have I felt more convinced that when coming out from there, that the greatest and the most irremediable ill for a people is to be conquered. So this is uh, a mixed legal system as perceived in a time when there was no literature on mixed jurisdiction by comparative law lawyers. Basically, a system not working properly uh, with a lot of confusion going around. I was forced to think to your uh, presentation uh, yesterday to this very uncertain situation that the courts in uh, trust are coping with, more or less. And uh, of course, this was often brought about by colonialism. That is to say, either by confrontation such as confrontation between the Brits once more, but in this case against the French, or the confrontations between the colonizing powers and the locals. And so it was often linked to a dynamic of power rather than 
uh, mere cultural contact. Now, with the benefit of a few, uh, a few years going by, these mixed legal systems are going on rehabilitation, and they are probably trying to learn from some failures. And it's a good question. Is it possible to learn and recover from this? <laughs> uh, I have the impression that for some people, like for Tocqueville, there is no remedy to this. But in some areas, and probably the literature produced by these mixed jurisdictions is trying to do this, there's the attempt to bring a more positive view of what has been going on. Positive in which sense? There is a broader conceptual and linguistic repertoire. And this is enriching. It may be a source of confusion, yes, but if, if handled with some care, it is important. And surely, for example, in Quebec, they did a huge effort to produce a terminology in both languages that could avoid that type of confusion that um, uh, Tocqueville was mentioning. It took a huge uh, effort and a substantial number of years, but probably nowadays Quebec is fully equipped to deal with any legal issue, uh, any legal issue in both languages, which is an achievement, a true achievement. Then there is a certain sensitivity for law from below in the sense of law as the byproduct of social interactions. You are never quite comfortable when you are in an ambience like that. But after a while, you realize that everybody is in trouble and then you have to decide what to do and probably try to um, you know, help each other a little bit. And this means that you know that you know, a positive enactment by the state will not solve the situation. It has to be to come from, from how people react to uh, certain social situations. So there's a, a growing sensitivity, surely, for this type of dimension, which brings also into the picture a sensitivity for implicit normative ways, because we all know that no matter what a state policy is, if it's undermined by the very officials that should be uh, taking care of that policy, the message is lost and the implicit, uh, um, how to say, the implicit um, dimension wins because you actually know that the state will not implement that policy. So all these type of reflections are linked to a more favorable appreciation of uh, mixed jurisdictions in the literature today. There is also certain attempts that I would not um, consider positive, that is to say also a renaissance of legal nationalism linked to mixed law jurisdictions. Uh, some of these jurisdictions are thinking of going independent. Scotland was the typical case recently in Europe. And surely, I had several talks with Scottish lawyers that were explicitly telling me that they were trying to get rid of whatever influence of English law had there been on the Scots uh, legal system. Very passionate about this. They were checking each doctrine on what exactly was it based to try to reinforce the civilian component of the legal system. I don't think this attitude is completely healthy for a number of reasons because basically it's a nationalist attitude. So you start claiming that you want to repossess, you want to be once more in possession of your own legal system. I think this is correct. But then you push it to prove the point that you really want a confrontation about what is the essence of that legal system. And I think this is a wrong attitude for reasons that perhaps I do not need to explain. Now, this is the situation that probably prevails nowadays in conversations and uh, in certain contributions. Basically, each 
legal system could be considered as mixed. First of all, the number of jurisdictions that have been listed as mixed, Roberto pointed to me to a web, pointed me, uh, website of the University of Ottawa that has such a list, is a very long list. But second, even those legal systems that are not included in that list could be considered mixed for a specific reason. That is to say, we by now realize through a huge literature on legal transplants or circulation of legal models, uh, last time that I checked it was over 300 titles on, on the topic, that in the making of a legal system quite often elements are taken from, from abroad. This is obvious in certain areas that had to modernize quickly and uh, were bound to take a certain civil code, translate it in the local language and put it into force. But even areas of old Europe that traditionally considered to be, are traditionally considered to be the original <coughs> source of certain ideas, if you start checking, there has been a lot of give and take. So from this point of view, one could say that actually this is where we stand. Purity is imaginary. It is not a real option, purity. Purity is a, a thing you claim for yourself, but probably this is, does not correspond to the facts on the ground. This is a big issue. What is the European Union? It is not a state, true, but if we think about it, and I have to do so because this is in the title of my topic, we realize that a lot of law is produced by this entity nowadays. A huge amount of uh, rules come from the European Union. These rules are quite mixed because they sometimes they compromise among different views, but in any case, they're often written more or less as Tocqueville thought, uh, that is to say, join in different type of voices, style of discourse, and so on. Now, the European Union is doing this probably to be inclusive. And, you know, quite often we know that they try to choose a neutral language through autonomous notions, through a number of devices and technique. And yet, it is true that it is not as inclusive as some or many EU citizens would like it, like it to be. But I doubt this can be the, uh, you know, put on the shoulders of the European Union full stop because the truth is that probably the same applies at the level of the member states. It's not that the member states have found a solution to this and the European Union is lagging behind. At the European level, we, tr we find more or less, as to this last point, ex exactly the situation that we find in, in the member states. Then we come to the point that Roberto um, stressed in his presentation and several among you stressed in the presentation, that is to say that Europe is characterized by a choice in favor of legal monism. I have the impression that there is a certain gap between the map we have, which says legal monism, and what we find on the terrain. One could say that this is due to the fact that you can be a monist and yet a pluralist. You can, you can put it in various ways. My point is that actually, even though the map says legal monism, legal monism is put under pressure from many sides. As Ventura pointed out, some compromises are more acceptable than others simply because they reflect the majority view, sanctioned by custom or by religion.
What about religious laws in this picture? Strange enough, the category of mixed legal systems has seldom been used to conceptualize the coexistence and the mixing of secular and religious laws within the boundaries of European states in particular. Now, if you think of it, uh, we could say that all European systems were in a certain sense mixed because for a long time they had the secular law but also the religious law administered by different institutions and there was a lot of borrowing across the divide. We know, for example, if we study the history of contract law, even tort law, several concepts were first elaborated by the canonists and then they transmigrated to the secular side. In England as well, and not just on the continent. And yet, we don't use the notion of a mixed legal system with respect to this problem. Not that I'm aware of. The question is why? Probably because when the comparative law lawyers started working, they focused only on the law of the secular state. If you uh, take up uh, René David and these type of things, when they discuss Europe, basically they discuss the law of the secular state. Only when they start discussing the other legal systems, they recognize that religious laws were, you know, uh, a strong component of those other legal systems. So probably they turned a blind eye to this situation simply because they were interesting in uh, presenting this uh, partition. On the one side, Europe that has secular legal systems, and on the other side, the other legal systems which are not that secular. But from my point of view, this is not uh, how things went. Europe itself was at a very large component of canon uh, law that governed lots of things until the 19th century turn. Or one could say it's not appropriate to speak of mixed legal systems here because these are always the same people wearing different hats. So there is no strong diversity implied here. It's not the Brits and the French on the same territory. It's always the Brits and always the French, one time playing as judges in uh, a secular court and one time playing as a judge in a canon law court, but the mentality cannot be completely different. And so it doesn't really help to use the category of mixed legal systems here. In any case, there are ways to treat these problems, and the most common way is the notion of pluralism. We have heard about reasonable accommodation today. I think one notion that could be picked up from other fields is the notion of multiple modernities. Um, this is a theory which has been developed um, by historians that have noticed that there is no single path to modernity. All societies have modernized, but in very different ways. And in a certain sense, even phenomena that we perceive to be the contrary of modernization, like Islamic terrorism, that is often presented as feudal, as a, actually is part of modernity. It cannot be defined as feudal. It is thoroughly modern. And of course we know that they use mass media, they do these things. So for a certain period of time, we thought that modernity meant just one thing and that all societies were going to converge around that notion. This was the Western view, of course, of what societies were going to be. Now we come, appreciate, we come to appreciate the fact that deep differences will remain, and these deep differences will nonetheless fit into a pattern that can only be termed modern, or if you prefer, 
postmodern. I never know where to draw the line exactly. But it's impossible to categorize some society as modern and others as being left behind. <clears throat> of course, uh, mixing is not just a matter of structure, but it's also a matter of individual agency. Beliefs are a typical uh, motor for mixing, and beliefs are individual beliefs quite often. One mistake I would not like to do is to consider re individuals as representatives of the respective legal system. So you assume that since a certain person is Muslim, it must be a representative of Sharia, and therefore Sharia applies to that person that perhaps didn't know that much about Sharia at all, given the life conditions. As many Catholics hold completely unorthodox beliefs and accommodate themselves to ways of living that would be definitely out of the orthodoxy. So I think individual agency means that the legal systems in which these individual agents fit will experiment a certain tension that should be taken into account. When we speak of reasonable accommodation, we should not only think about specific accommodations designed by the state, but by the fact that the individuals themselves in their life patterns are looking for this type of accommodations and sometimes are trying to navigate through the legal systems. And so mixing could be the, defined as the effect of individual agency at the border if no colonial power is involved in the, uh, or no, no state action is involved at the border. Thank you. Okay, we can now open up for questions. Um, yeah. Thank you. In constitutional law, we are now accustomed to talk of constitutional pluralism, in particular when it comes to the interaction between national constitutions, EU law, uh, in particular the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the European Convention, and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, as we all know, there is no hierarchical arrangement that regulates the uh, position of each one of these sources of law. Uh, and the, the whole system, or if you like, the three systems, work together and interact through a practice which is known as judicial dialogue. Uh, judicial, ju uh, judicial dialogue is really the tool which has made possible the coexistence of constitutional pluralism. And uh, I think that many suggestions that come from uh, Michele's presentation, I open a small bracket. I knew why I did ask you to talk about that, and I was uh, then right. Uh, uh, I think that uh, many suggestions that come from your presentation somehow indicates, uh, indicates that uh, judicial review, sorry, uh, the judicial dialogue is an instrument we can rely on in order to achieve some reasonable accommodation. Uh, I wonder if that might apply also, for instance, to some Asian countries, and perhaps Andrew might like to say something about it. For instance, when you mentioned yesterday that uh, state courts defer even uh, uh, issues on procedural ground to uh, Sharia courts. Uh, isn't that a form of dialogue? Isn't that a form of, uh, of uh, a coexistence of uh, uh, plurality, in this case of legal uh, pluralism, whereas we deal in Europe with constitutional pluralism? So once again, the burden seems to be on the judiciary. Uh, I'd like to have your opinion on this. Thank you. Andrew, you want to add something? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, I think this is consistent with the uh, the paper we, we just heard, that if you have 
legal traditions coexisting within a certain field, they will tend to uh, affect each other. Um, I mean, in the particular context that I was talking about, there's a very good article by Donald Horowitz talking about exactly the ways in which um, the common law has influenced the Sharia courts in Malaysia in terms of the, uh, of the procedural uh, elements and uh, the way evidence is, is handled and so on. And um, I mean, it's very interesting to me that there is, there is now one law school in Malaysia that has set out uh, t specifically with the objective of trying to bring the two systems together by teaching every subject within the frame of both Sharia and common law. You know, it, it goes even further than that because um, you know, it's not simply parallel courses, it's within the same course. So if you're, if you're uh, studying property law, then you, you see how it's handled under Islamic law and how it's handled under the common law system and, and how they, they relate to each other or can be uh, compared. So sorry, that's too long an answer, but the, in short, yes. But, but hang on, Andrew, we did that at SOAS in the 80s before you came. <laughs> and spoiled it. <laughs> no, no, no. But we, we did those things, you know, and then the old colonial That's professors right. were yes. there. Yeah? Yes. They taught That's equity right. and property and all that, you know, with little components of Islamic law and Hindu law and Jewish oh, law. Oh, yes, it's, and not, it's not so unusual. Yeah. But my point is that this is with the specific objective of affecting the legal system itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how they, yeah. they view the, the legal system developing in, in future, bringing the two the two things together. Uh, so, you know, maybe the Scots shouldn't be, you know, too worried about their, <laughs> their mixed in inheritance in that sense. Okay. If I have nobody else wanting to ask anything now, yeah? Briefly? The question is first to the issue of how you prove <coughs> Sharia and how the French judge got it wrong. Um, in common law, we have at least this presumption that foreign law is a matter of fact and it needs to be proven by expert witnesses. Wouldn't that have done the job if in an adversary system you have the two sides each bringing expert testimony and uh, you would kind of rely on the adversary system and uh, you should get it right. I mean, if uh, the presumption is that you as a judge uh, is unable to determine this issue of fact, it needs to be proven. W would that have helped? Um, I, I, I was just cu curious. And going back to the issue of um, mixed jurisdictions, wouldn't you also count in international law? I mean, if you counted in European law in terms of the states, so it's inevitable that international law is, is, is generating all of these treaties, all of these institutions, all of these tribunals, and you would have this shadow effect, even if it's not directly applicable within the state, but the shadow effect of international law is already influencing states in terms of devising all sorts of norms, especially in terms of human rights. So if it exists, and you would need to report, you would need to be held or maybe accountable before some of these tribunals. It, it has the shadow effect of generating amendments within the law that would be coming from other sources. So I, I would suggest if you would add European law, maybe international law generally would, would, would also be a source for this, this mixed jurisdiction nature. since it applies to the whole world uh, unless it's a specific treaty among countries. So I was interested in taking up a territorial entity like the European Union and showing uh, that this is an overarching framework that is built by negotiating these differences. And But yes, uh, the, the dynamic is the same at the international level, quite a lot of international law is uh, the produce of this type of effort as well. I think um, <clears throat> there are mm, two, two problems. Uh, 
the the first uh, is the level level uh, the understanding for the judges uh, the religious law and general religious law in particular Islamic law and the second level is the problem of uh, uh, interpretation an instrument for interpretation the uh, uh, religion's law uh, I I do know for example for in in the the Italian system uh, there is the problem about uh, the interpretation of uh, uh, canon law by the judges about the um, marriage law the marriage regulation uh, so in this case uh, the the judges is uh, uh, interpretation uh, the, the 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 rules the religion's rules uh, with the instruments uh, uh, what regards the uh, civil civil law and uh, the result the result it's it's uh, it's strange <laughs> Uh, I like your suggestion, Roberto, that uh, judges should, uh, you know, be more familiar with different legal systems. But how far can we drive this? You know, can we expect judges in European jurisdictions to be familiar with all sorts of legal systems? Obviously not. And the uh, technique uh, used in the uh, common law system is obviously to use expert reports or use experts, yeah, as you just explained. Um, but that again has limits because you get all sorts of strange queries now. You know, what's the law of Ecuador on this set and the other end? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you will probably say a bit about judicial uh, specializations and all that. So we'll, we'll maybe um, um, elaborate on that later. But uh, are you suggesting, this is my question to you, Roberto, are you suggesting that European law schools given that uh, you know, we all seem to agree with Michele that we are all mixed now, that European law schools should actually be introducing um, more knowledge of um, these legal systems. Judges have been saying to me, you know, we should all be studying at SOAS. You know, then we would be a bit cleverer um, and better prepared for our job. Yeah? And you see that the Indian law schools, for example, which have to prepare judges for a very plural system, are not doing a good job these days because they're not giving a lot of importance to um, personal laws. They're not training their students in Muslim law and Hindu law. And so their judges are lacking the kind of skills that they desperately need in their system. So, uh, I mean, a straightforward question to you is your recommendation that, um, you know, the better law schools in Europe ought to pluralize and become mixed. <laughs> I, I, I think <clears throat> uh, there is a very gap. N now, uh, I, I, I know the situation in, in Italy, but there is a very uh, big gap uh, between uh, between the formation of uh, scholars in the, the in the university system and uh, the, the 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 formation of uh, judges, but that goes also for practicing lawyers. You know, uh, they, all, they all learn also all the sorts of law in law school, but they are not prepared for practice. For example, for the for example, for the in 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 the Italian system. Uh, for um, formation of lawyers, uh, the, 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 the areas, uh, it, 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 uh, there isn't 
the argument with uh, law and religions because it, it is an interpretation for uh, uh, separation also or level uh, scientific level. Yeah, but a good family lawyer, for example, you know, I mean, Ilka, you know this, a good family lawyer these days needs to know different legal cultures. And you make much more business if you know these kinds of things. But our law schools are not preparing people for that. Yeah, but how? It's not offered in the official system. Where do you go? Yeah, but uh, I mean, Eliza will be able to tell us in how many universities in Italy do they teach Islamic law? Yeah, not many. Can you see? Yeah, I mean, it's not there. Yeah, it's something that probably ought to be addressed. Yeah, and I mean, you ask for courses specifically on that, and um, this kind of course is a great success in Italy, exactly because it's not taught. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Prakash is next. Uh, yeah, th thanks a lot to, the, to all the presenters. Very, very interesting morning session. Um, just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that uh, uh, Michele Grazide you, you mentioned about. First of all, <clears throat> the issue about uh, multiple modernities. Um, and I'm, I'm still li left a little bit intrigued about what the content of this modernity actually is. You know, what is it that's supposed to have actually been globalized um, but yet hybridized at the same time. Uh, and I would, I would offer a, di a different kind of suggestion, which is to, in order to give content for what actually got exported with uh, modernity, which is, you can say is a European product, is this particular process that I was adverting to yesterday, which is the um, way in which certain ideas from within Western culture get secularized and globalized. And so the task <laughs> Uh, for the kind of agency uh, legal systems that we heard about from yesterday is really to try to cope with facets of these exports as have occurred in the form of legal transplantations and so on. And of course, it's true to say that there are multiple ways in which different legal systems around the world have coped with these, right? And that, that's what accounts for a trope like multiple, multiple modernities. But if you just say modernities, it seems like it's, it's a thing without content. Right? So we have to give it some kind of definite cultural content, um, which is what I would plead for. Um, and of course, I, I, I th the, the, you also mentioned something very interesting, which is that th this kind of traditional neglect of uh, particular jurisdictions which have existed within Western countries, right? Uh, so the specific canon law, inheritance, and so on. Um, and I would submit that that's also part of this larger process of the secularization of Christianity in, to the extent that and we had some quite interesting discussion over, over dinner uh, with David, and I think Marco also adverted to this, uh, this question, is how Christians now have to go to courts to assert their rights in Western jurisdictions, right? Um, so what you have is a very interesting phenomenon whereby secularization takes the form of the generalization of tropes which come from within Christianity, but Christians have to, uh, are put in a position of having to complain about them in court systems. Right? Uh, so you have a kind of very new and recent phase of this kind of thing happening, but I think it speaks to the kind of diagnosis you were making about how it was once a to Here's up. to clarify this last point when you're saying that Christians are complaining so they have to go to court. Because I don't quite get... No, Christians complain, let's, uh, let's put it in a different way. Christians complain in, complain in courts because of the influence of secularization and, and secularism, heavy secularism, and they feel that the, the pressure of that, you know. So I'm, I'm trying to argue something which is ostensibly inconsistent, which is that Christianity secularizes itself by universalizing itself, or, or the other way around, universalizes by secular, which creates problems for particular religions within Christianity. Yeah. You know, so that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. Shall I add something to this, Prakash? I think Michele very rightly says, uh, and I'm coming back to this in a moment with this picture that's on the wall, that we are all mixed now. But we are not just mixed now, we are also all nervous now about who we are and who the others are. And so, you know, we, we are tending to run to court for help and we are testing, you know, maliciously testing occasionally, yeah, how far things can go and how far 
this mixedness can be driven. Yeah? And, and I think that's what we see as well. Yeah? So it's not always um, a benevolent trying to figure out how things work, but it's also a testing of limits. Yeah? And an exploration of, of you know, the limits of tolerability often. I mean, the Ladeli case is, is quite clearly one of those. Yeah? Um, we don't have any other urgent questions. Yeah? Okay? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, dialogue, uh, I don't speak. Uh, I don't talk about dialogue between uh, uh, between the nation and constitution and so. On, but dialogue between the um, nation law and the religious law. Uh, I do think that we have to consider the fact that sometimes uh, there is no possibility to have a dialogue because there is a there is a contrast between the public proposals based on the human rights, for example, the protection of human rights as affirmed in main constitution, and the religious law. Take for example, ye yesterday I tried to to, to say uh, that. Take for example the Shaobano case. Uh, the India judges at the Supreme Court, they, they tried to interpret uh, the uh, Sharia law uh, saying that there is no contrast between uh, human rights stated in the Constitution and uh, uh, the, the interpretation of the Sharia law. But many Muslims organizations took the street against this decision, saying that, no, you are not... A, uh, legitimized to do that, uh, and this is uh, a very wrong interpretation. So we have to consider this. Uh, this uh, we have not just denied the contrast between, uh, you know, uh, the religious law sometimes and the public basic purposes. Want to respond? Because I have a response. If, if these is, two this haven't got any. For me, this is not a question but a comment, really. So I don't have to, I don't think I have to reply to this. Okay, but to me it's a question and a challenge. <laughs> because if you are saying that there is no hope of, you know, uh, conversation, I think you're wrong. Because the protest, the public protest of the Indian Muslims was a form of conversation. It said, no, we don't like this because we men now have to pay. And we don't like this position. Yeah? The, pro-women interpretation of the Supreme Court. Yeah. Wait, 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 and the discussion then goes on because what people have misunderstood the world over is there is then, because here's a public order problem, there's chaos. Yeah? The Gandhi government then makes an act in 1986 and people like you and others have misunderstood this. <laughs> and said, Gandhi caves <laughs> in to these warring Muslims. No, 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 he did not. They made an act, yes. But they made an act that says things exactly like the Supreme Court said in the Shabanu case. But we only hear about this in 2001, yeah? two weeks after 9-11 or a little later. No? At a very strategic moment when the Indian Supreme Court knew that Indian Muslims would not riot. They would not dare to riot in September 2001. And they were chup, they did nothing. Yeah? And so they changed two days later, imagine two days later, they changed the Christian divorce law and introduced lots of grounds for divorce, but they changed the entire maintenance law of India because they removed the upper limit of 500 rupees for women under the criminal procedure code. There's now no limit under the criminal procedure code as there is no limit under this separate Muslim act. So they reinstated uh, legal uniformity. But people haven't noticed this because these are tiny little acts that take five lines. Yeah? And, and so I, I think the argument that there is no hope for interaction and engagement and conversation, that is dangerous because that leads to terror. reach this, uh, this point, for example, the, the protection of human rights, uh, on the basis uh, of the religious law, of the interpretation of religious law? That's, that's my question. I have no answer, but, you know, it's, uh, I, it's a question for me. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes uh, 
I see some contradiction. No, uh, there, is a, there is an effort to uh, interpret uh, the religious law, but it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very dangerous in terms of religious law. It's not accepted, for example. No. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you are true that there is a certain contradiction in the position of uh, Catholics and Christians nowadays because it is true that there is a certain uh, plight, if, you, if you'd like, because in principle the position that I noticed, at least in Italy, is that uh, the state should not try to regulate a number of things. If the state does, this is uh, understood as a problem by the Catholics. Uh, uh, and, and the same uh, applies for what courts are doing in certain areas. Clearly, nobody dares to criticize the Constitutional Court in Italy very openly, but all the rulings that the Constitutional Court gave in matters of in vitro fertilization were uh, to remedy what the Catholics wanted to be there and turned out to be incompatible with the rational assessment of the matter. So it is clear that not all co uh, Catholics are comfortable within the framework that we have now. Full stop, I, I don't think I need to add uh, more about this. So although one could say that we live in a dominant ethos, which is the dominant ethos of Christianity. The position of the state is not always perceived to be fully legitimate, but uh, by parts of the uh, by parts of the community. So I don't think it's just Muslims that have problems with the legitimacy of the state in a number of instances. And so, but but this is sad, I think because the state was something that we all wanted at a certain point, because the alternative was worst, <laughs> if you see my point. That is to say, a central state came about in order to remedy local abuses quite often. And so, uh, at least, usually the periods in which the state was frail was periods of disorders, and of course then you have the problem that you you must teach states to live together, which is not obvious as we have learned recently. Coming to your other point, um, I, I made a statement in two different senses. The first sense, there's a certain tendency to ascribe modernity only to certain experiences. I think this is wrong. That is to say, even if you live uh, in parts of the world that you wouldn't probably consider to be at the center of this uh, change that has been going on uh, for a while by now, they are part of the story. It's impossible today to draw the line and say some parts of the world are modern, but other parts are not you can end up in very remote places and you still see the impact of transnational tendencies, be it an NGO going there or, uh, you know. Then perhaps these people don't like it, but uh, I don't like it either necessarily over here. The other point is the deeper point that you were uh, addressing. Yes, but what exactly is this? I think it's a combination of a tech uh, set, uh, of uh, the diffusion of certain technical factors that have an impact because once agriculture is industrialized is no more the same practice as it was when it was traditional and of course uh, some ideologies and some worldviews so I, th uh, I, I do not have the time to you know to offer the full treatment but we know quite a lot about this by now I don't think I'm discovering these things myself. So this is how I see it. It's extremely important to avoid the impression that we stand on the, you know, on the bandwagon and the rest are not uh, there. 
uh, because this actually misrepresents, from my point of view, completely what is going on at the world level. I think we've come to the end of this discussion. Thank our two speakers. All right. um, I, I take the privilege now because uh, Roberto challenged me to fly some kites, to spend a couple of minutes to simply show you a couple of slides instead of giving a presentation or something, just to update you on things that are going on, because they're actually the same things that have just been said, but now in picture form. And then, of course, Marie-Claire has the final word. So I've got here confirmation of what we were told. Can I have the mic? Confirmation of what we were told, that we are all mixed. Even if we assume in the global north that we are a uniform system, we have heard in so many ways that monism is not actually pure monism in practice. There is the theoretical possibility of monism, yeah? But in practice, it's just not even there, and it's not even recommendable. You made that so clear. Uh, and you have this middle type where we make special exemptions for indigenous people to give them rights, and this happens all over the world. We had examples from the Malays in Singapore. You have examples from uh, Malaysia, but we have them from all over the world, and we had in Ravenna in March, wonderful examples from Latin America also. The type three law is exactly what we are seeing in Asia and Africa, but this is of course what Muslims and others now want when they live in Europe. Yeah? So it seems to matter uh, where we are, where we are located. Silvio, this is now an answer to your question. You know, which system, which method of regulation um, offers a more effective, a better way of managing this. Uh, we are, to some extent, probably bound by history. We live in a place that has developed structures in a particular way, or like Greece you know, is bound by an international treaty that you said can't be done away with, even in 2023. Yeah? <laughs> and in other places, they live you know, by a personal law system like in Sarawak that you showed, you know, the, 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 the paradise almost, yeah, of, of Sarawak without state involvement. So um, we approach the glass that we see or the moon that we see from different uh, directions. We see an empty glass or a full glass, yeah, or we see a different moon. But we have clearly also a mixity, uh, a plurality of different approaches to all of this. And um, I never realized how much I agree with Michele, but when you spoke today, uh, I really thought, oh, wow, yeah? What is this man saying? <laughs> yeah? you, you described um, law basically as um, you know, a performance, yeah? uh, a theater in court. No? And, and I've seen this happen, of course, in South Asia as well. So I want to show you quickly uh, this thing here. Um, the uh, idea that when we look at law these days, we should look at um, this um, phenomenon from four different perspectives. Yeah? And um, this comes now to the modernity question that you asked. Yeah? So <laughs> I think in all four corners, there are actually modernities happening that are competing. Wait, this is, of course, much more dynamic. It's in the air, it flies, yeah? it changes every second. You know, we, life is not the same, next second, all right? Um, but I want to look at power, because you talked about this all being a game of power, all right? So when we have now these four elements of, you know, natural law, social legal approaches, positive law, and international law and human rights. In all four corners, there are elements of the other corners. That's one thing. But in all four corners also, there are these challenges of modernities, competing modernities. And you're so right to say that we cannot claim that our corner, the positivist corner or whatever, is modern and the other is not. And this is why I objected to your uh, suggestion that it isn't possible to debate things at times, because if we stop debating, we cut out one of these or two of these corners, and then we have exactly violence and terror. And so that's not possible. 
So what we have to do in today's mixed hybrid existence, we have to learn to manage the coexistence of these competing elements. But what we actually do, and you will probably talk about this in a moment when you talk about judges, because they do this. You put the element that you hate most last. So you start from a particular perspective as a human rights activist or a judge or a Muslim or a member of a family. And then the question comes, OK, where do I go next? Where's my starting position? And what do I hate most? And then come all sorts of potential answers to Silvio's question about you know, how can states effectively manage or maybe fail to manage. But I think one very clear answer we got from this conference is that states are not the only actor in this field. Yeah? And states often have to react to challenges that are thrown at them. Yeah? They are not in the driving seat, even if they think that they are and parliament is strong and whatever. Uh, and we had just now a discussion about you know, the role of judges, very clear, everywhere. You know? Judges are ultimately the ones that have to do this. So I'll shut up here and simply tell you that these things exist. If you want more information, it's on the web. Uh, it's everywhere, but you can send me an email. Yeah? Um, but I want to give space now to Marie-Claire because it's important that we listen to you and have your final uh, summing up of our conference. Uh, I kept quiet most of the time, but it's because I was listening, and I thought uh, I should maybe keep my comments for, for the last moment. But I won't take kind of high profile. I will really take a low profile role. What I will try to do is kind of put some structure in retrospect huh, um, to what was said in this room. And I, and I really think of, Roberto, what you were mentioning yesterday, if we go for a publication, so how in retrospect I think a number of issues are kind of word being mentioned by way of conclusion. But in French we say these are conclusions à chaud, which is, I mean, I even tried to react to the, to try to say what, what, see what Werner said to the very last moment. So I might be differently from you, Roberto, who gave every person a really nice place in this dynamic, maybe unfair to some papers that I will not really do justice to. Um, I just gave a subtitle uh, to uh, this meeting. What we have been doing, and I know hesitant whether I still use the word accommodating. Let's say we have been addressing religious diversity and clearly, as you said, Lorenzo, this morning, within the state legal framework, and you called it in the end a positive secularism, we want to give the state a positive role, but you also said we will see whether the state managed and whether the state is the kind of appropriate way or level, but for lack of other levels. But it had a main impact on the way of thinking because, for example, parallel justice if you, from a state-centered point of view, of course, there is no parallel justice unless the state granted some type of recognition. But if you abandon the state-centered approach, there is very efficient parallel justice. So I'll say that we have been thinking within the framework uh, of uh, the state. Now, you, <laughs> Michele, you are not kind of part of the club of the people that deal with religion. I'm not part of the club of the people who used to compare. But nevertheless, I've been trying to do this kind of, are we in a position that we can compare uh, the systems in the different uh, countries that we have been discussing in this room. And in anthropology, we easily speak of false comparisons because the more you go in-depth into the context, the, the more there is the risk that your comparisons are not valid. 
because things can't be as easily uh, compared. So the basic question is, aren't all these contexts not too different to allow uh, valid comparisons, let alone draw conclusions? No? Um, so I, I better be very prudent, but I think that what this meeting shows is uh, that through the comparison, you see very clearly one thing that we share in common. It's the, the really crucial role of the context. And you referred to the power. I think it's all about power relations at play. And then the very question is, of course, this is on the one hand unavoidable. It's not new. But the question is, does it turn to be out to be unfair to people because it's in the hands of a state that is not really in the position to address it? And then we could speak of failed states. No? I'm coming from a failed state, so I, <laughs> I dare to will. We are failed in uh, terrorism uh, fight. So and anyhow, so what is, and I will be kind of very prudent in what I say, but I think the very strength of this meeting, I was really very impressed profound familiarity with the context that each of the speakers were addressing, whether coming for themselves from this context or the whether it haven't been studied this context. And that, I think, was the really richness no, of uh, this meeting. And so I think I learned a lot uh, how, how this power plays no, turn out to be fair and unfair at the same time, depending on of who you think, no? um, Malaysia, Singapore, India, and then we mentioned countries, but without digging into it, Pakistan, no? uh, then Israel extensively, and then for Europe, unfair, because we only dealt with the UK and with Greece, uh, we mentioned Canada, so we, we digged into very different uh, kind of contexts. Now, when I tried to, yesterday night, think fairly of how could I cover all what was said here is uh, by just thinking of two parts. Um, if we really want to see these contexts at play in the different countries, I was thinking of a, a model to bring them into the comparison is when state law is faced with diversity, there are at least three levels of analysis that you have to distinguish. There are, I think, three questions and then I dare to think of three trends, but that could be a, an issue of discussion. And then very briefly, when we think of a future-oriented approach, are we thinking of state intervention, or are we going for self-determination? And then since we have been discussing extensively the conflict of law rules approach, um, is this still the appropriate way to go? In which type of context, yes. And in which type of context, clearly no. And then, are the concepts of cultural and religious uh, diversity to be revisited? And you hinted at it, and uh, I would like to come back to this. Now, as I said, three levels of analysis. Um, there is promotion of diversity, including uh, religious diversity, on the global level. In some countries, like in Europe, the regional context and the European Court of Human Rights is there to be a very specific regional context. And then, of course, there is diversity in the domestic sphere. But when you look then concretely into the context of all these countries, is the same instruments are dealt with very differently. When you think of the universal protection of the freedom of religion, some of the countries that were mentioned have this reservation. I mean, Islamic countries have a main reservation in the way they deal with that one instrument. Very interestingly would be another universal instrument, which is the SEDAW, the rights of women, and the link with religion there. So, and also countries accompany a policy of human rights or do all but to accompany it, which is they ratify, full stop. But there is no education, there is no training. If, if you ask a person in a country that really was kind of ratifying the SEDAW after 25 years what it means, the SEDAW, nobody knows. But the country plays the card of non-discrimination. So what does the country do with this kind of global level and the freedom of religion and the protection of it? And the diversity and its protection within the regional context, and I think that it was fabulous on your part, uh, Marco, this kind of the famous instrument, the same disposition, living its own life and reflecting a kind of change of sensitivity within majority society when it comes to protect it in a concrete context. No? So this also has to be taken into account before you can start comparing. No? Um, 
and the diversity in the domestic legal sphere, of course, we all saw that legislation, and you said it, is reactive. No? It's clear that regarding the kind of new type of cultural and religious diversity we are faced with, legislatures lag behind, and if they do respond, rarely they respond with sustainable solutions. The legislation, and I speak then for Europe, regarding uh, religious freedom, if amendments, if amendments are very much ad hoc, they are always very reactive, they draw inspiration from the past, it was mentioned what the Muslim Concordat in Spain, I mean, it, it's all ad hoc, reactive, and very often very defensive. So, uh, when you said Michele Law as a byproduct of social interactions, I think that so far it's not in the really fully democratic sense of the term, because the new religious minorities are very often absent from the institutional settings no, where the legislations are being amended. And that explains, I think, for a large part, this kind of reactive, defensive way legislators amend their own laws. So it's, it's, very, it's not really thinking with a visionary approach. It's let's, let's handle it now since there is an urgent need, but it's it's very protective of mainstream, uh, in my sense, and for the countries I know of uh, in Europe. And all this, I think, has to be taken into account when we think of comparison. It's, uh, now, three questions. Um, of course, the legal techniques are not the same depending on the arena in which you think of religious diversity and we have been dealing with family law, and that is the reason probably because we have been thinking so much in terms of private international law and of personal uh, laws. But uh, if you think of labor law, for example, you would have to deal with a very different type of techniques. No? And then depending whether it's a private or the public sector, no? and whether with conscientious objection you get anywhere, maybe you need reasonable accommodation ju just to, to really in-depth think of including religious diversity in the workplace. So these are other techniques. Education, we just addressed it very briefly, but do we do justice to religious minorities in education? This would require other legal techniques. In penal law, as I said, we tend to be very defensive, and what you see in Europe, we criminalize a number of religious practices, or we address them through exemptions. And very strikingly, we granted exemptions to the Jews, Judaism, and since Judaism shares a number of practices with Islam, we start thinking of withdrawing the exemptions. So you get a kind of Islamization of Judaism in Europe, and it's a kind of striking that all countries start now thinking of revising the exemption when it comes to the ritual slaughtering. We have had the whole discussion about the boar circumcision. So this whole issue all of a sudden is being problematized because linked with one problematic religious community. That's one way of thinking of penal law. And of course the other is considering that religion might be a mitigating circumstance. And there also you see a double standard in the case law. For some religions, it's not really a problem, but for some religions, it will never be a mitigating circumstance. So depending on really the setting, you will have to think of other techniques of law, and always and again, are we in an appropriate way dealing with the new religious uh, diversity? And more importantly, probably for the type of setting that we were in here, is uh, what is the origin of the cultural or religious diversity? And I could think of three. Or the religious diversity and cultural diversity is being imposed. And that is typically the colonial setting. No? All of a sudden, you're being confronted with a new type of normative thinking. Um, or it's homegrown, and the homegrown diversity we live with. And this is what we switch then in constitutional mechanisms no? of protection of some religions, mainly the main majority religions, they feel at ease because the constitutional mechanisms are there. So this homegrown uh, religious diversity is not really a problem. And then you get this kind of new type of way of being confronted with religious diversity. This is creeping Islam. And I use the term on purpose because this is what politicians use in terms of metaphor. This is the imposition from below. Uh -uh. That doesn't work. And it's really kind of perceived as a problematic no? cultural diversity unexpected uh, and the wrong type of diversity. And, and this has a main impact on the kind of interaction you get between law and cultural and religious differences. No? We are much more easygoing with one's 
own minorities. Who was it who said Malaysians in Singapore? This is home. This is this is the mine. This is our minority, and you you grant them easily exemptions. You don't even think of accommodation. It's a kind of self-evidence. And there are a number of interesting works uh, that really kind of play with this kind of uh, a diversity that is not a problem because it is kind of it was kind of. Uh, anticipating the state, which is the typical indigenous people. No? Uh, when you think of Kimlika, who says, well, we owe them accommodation since we have been imposing our state construction upon them. In the US, there was an interesting book in the 80s. Now it's kind of desperately dated because the illustrations are dated. But American cultural pluralism and the law, how, how romantic they have been in granting accommodations to Amish people because it was our own past. So you just identify with these people as your own past. You kind of, so this kind of museological approach no, of, of diversity and uh, in a sense, the Martinez case you refer to is also this kind of taking still for granted this kind of accommodation since these are our kind of uh, religions. No? Uh, and I think, Lorenzo, you said it to the end and your fourth conclusion, Marco, went also in this direction. The new minorities, they have no voice and they have no institutional voice so far. And when I think of the Islam, since they are internally so divided, it is extremely difficult for them to push a kind of uh, argument through uh, in this kind of uh, institutional setting of negotiating the future uh, of uh, countries and including then uh, Europe. Do we uh, see convergences, trends uh, in the different settings we have been looking at, if any? Then I would say three, at least I see uh, three. The first is a trend that our legislators are really not only faced with a diversity that is being perceived by their public opinion as problematic and therefore uh, not necessarily willing to go into it, but they are also sandwiched because on the one hand, this globalization, and on the other hand, something that is increased individualization of lifestyles, and that has not necessarily to do with religion. It's really your lifestyle a la carte, and you expect legislators to allow you no, for procreative rights, for family, all lifestyles, or a la carte, it must be the kind of, and then we find kind of evident, unless and up to the moment that other people want to have the same. And then, so this being sandwiched between a globalization, my first kind of experience with globalization, I was kind of surprised, is when in France you had this kind of, the first decision that the headscarf would be prohibited in the schools. You had the same afternoon in Tehran, a kind of uh, protest on the streets against the French prohibition. There was a kind of globalized view of what you could call transnationalization of religious minorities. No? They identify with a cause and they really follow the case. Of course, this is because there was e-communication, but, but that was uh, an example no? of a globalized phenomenon. Of uh, Another kind of, we refer to it, is this kind of the fetwas worldwide, people consulting no? internet to look for the right fetwa, to have a, a, an authority they can work with. No? or the other way around, kind of universal legal clinics for Muslima. No? How is the right way to think of your gender no? in a globalized world and remaining a faithful Muslima? And this, it's very interesting to read and it's very professional as well. This is this kind of globalized, uh, and for legislators, of course, very difficult to handle this. Um, I think this is a common uh, kind of trend. Uh, another kind of uh, very kind of characteristic, and we discussed it all the time, is this kind of role of the case law. And how would you how would you kind of make up your mind about this role? We all feel a bit uncomfortable because we feel that also the judges really are uncomfortable with the situation, um, and and the judges sometimes feel that they are expected to fill the gap, no? uh, whereas there are the legislature is not yet there, and I think we cannot blame the judges for doing things when they are not necessarily trained and when there are overstretched expectations about what they can do. And judges also very often say, we are instrumentalized. Now, who said that the forum shopping? A judge perfectly knows there is a cost-benefit analysis behind the very the very claim. So he has, well, he feels sometimes, a kind, not, not a judge, but just a, the conveyor of a facility. You know? uh, and what judges then very often do, it was mentioned by you, Prakash, uh, they claim l'ordre public, you know? or 
there is a double standard. We feel more at ease with some practices than with others. All in all, you can say there is a kind of bricolage. No? Uh, and uh, I was really impressed with the presentation of our colleague uh, Mazzola when he said the functional equivalent. But how do you implement a functional equivalent? Because this is really requiring not just to try to understand what it is, but to put it in its context, in the function it has in the legal regime, where it does come from. I think we we are really expecting too much from the judges, or we should accompany them, either with expert witnesses, but in continental Europe, I think what would work better is that within the Ministry of Justice, there would be highly professional services, no? that, and free, which is, otherwise it's again for an elite who can afford an expert, but free kind of advice on legal systems all over the world. Is it too much asked? can't re maybe at European level, no? that this would be a service that could improve the quality of the case law and release the judges from this impossible task that they have to understand and put practices that are unknown in our systems into the context. So that's my answer to your equivalent uh, approach. And a third trend, I think, is clearly the, the right to equal treatment and non-discrimination everywhere. It's an argument but it plays out in different ways. And I think there we have also to be honest, there is the professionalization, the equality bodies, but they have their own priorities. No? Uh, LGBT people, if you look at what they kind of managed to get under the non-discrimination in 25 years time, I mean, you cannot say the same for religion. Uh, so uh, majority religions are also even more successful no, than my, so I think that the whole business no, of the non-discrimination is also something that needs to be put in context and that is different from the one country to the other. When I think of minority religions, for example, I see that the equality body in the Netherlands is much more kind of professional and, and lobbying so to say, for religious minorities than in France, for example. So I, I think that all this is to really be put in the context before we can think of comparisons uh, between countries. And then my last slide is about how do we think of the future. I share with you, Lorenzo, that I think, I don't mean for lack of better, but we have to do with the state. No? We see that when there is no state, in the sense of that, that you get trouble with every mixed situation, with every conversion, that it produces all type of strategies. No? Uh, well, if we then think of addressing diversity within a state uh, order, we have been discussing a lot the techniques of the conflict of laws, and I see pros and I see cons. Um, there is decrease of relevance, but there is also increase of relevance. A decrease of relevance in the sense of we can't keep addressing diversity when it is a situation of stabilized migration. Then the look for the appropriate connecting factor is not the appropriate factor, because you, you really encourage forum shopping. People resurrect a nationality for the only sake of getting something that they don't get in the country of their residence. In fact, you create privileges, and it's very elitist. But it's only the, the one who knows how to handle, who has access to the information, who can then get through conflict of law. So I think for stabilized migration, it is probably not uh, the right way to go. But I'm living in Germany for the moment. A one million people coming for the most from Muslim countries. Uh, this is for the next number of years, bringing with it new private international law with people that came without documents, with people that came from countries where nothing is registered, uh, with people that feel that they would like to come with their families. Uh, how, how shall we handle this? No? So there is a lot no, about private international law that we are facing in terms of the cases will come. And there is also increase of relevance within Europe. What are we doing in Europe? So for lack of harmonization of family laws, we have to fall back on all the techniques of private international law, which is granting recognition to judgments from abroad. This is allowing people that have other laws with regards, for example, family names, to export these family names to other countries. So Europe is now a real exploratory kind of laboratorium no? of private international law. So there is also increase. Whether these are the really appropriate ways to handle this, it's for lack of harmonization. You can't tell people you can move freely 
and, and not without your family, without your personal laws. So I think in Europe there is surprisingly an, an increase of relevance of personal laws through the EU construction of free circulation of people. So, and I think it's a highly technical domain and it's very dynamic and there are a number of instruments and it's Brussels 2, Brussels 3, Brussels 3 bis and I mean there is a production of, of techniques that are in fact the, the kind of circulation of personal laws uh, in Europe. But there is a risk of a double standard because we, for us, for our own aims, we sophisticate the rules ne, of, uh, for example, release of exequatur, make it easy for people that they move with their family lives. But when it comes from people from outside Europe, mind you, then, as you said, Prakash, l'ordre public. I mean, because these, these are personal laws that, I mean, have no home here. And there is, I think, in private international law, a very interesting technique which we did not address is to allow in certain circumstances the parties to decide which law applies. And for matrimonial regimes and for divorce, we are just kind of experimenting in terms of in the text, but there is no practice. Because it's very expensive to find the right advice about what it means in the long term if you choose for that or that other law that you so the, the kind of uh, optio juris no, is a kind of new vein in private international law, but there is quasi no practice in family law. No? So should we think of another way uh, to address uh, the way we think of our societies in terms of uh, cultural, legal, and religiously diverse? Um, I think before we start doing this, we should really be documented much more richly on what belonging, faith, religion means to people. You briefly addressed it, no? the non-production by religious communities. It's flourishing everywhere. There is this gender ichtihad, women looking for sources to deal with, to be loyal citizens with religion. Religion not as a problem, but as an integral part of their identity. And I think that before we start thinking of new legal solutions, no? that we should really be looking for what the people no? need and what the people feel. I mean, it's maybe too luxurious to say that is really making our society to measure <laughs> uh, for these people. So I, I really feel that that is a way probably that we will prepare the future, is know much more uh, uh, of the people concerned. Um, and another kind of instrument in law that I think is clearly under uh, investigated in terms of its full potential is contractualization of relationships. No? I really think there is a vein, we already addressed it in Leuven, I also think that in family law there is really a possibility for people to combine, so to say, religious requirements with civil law, but it requires emancipation of people, training, education, both of the lawyers who accompany these people and of the people to be knowledgeable. No? of uh, what they can do with contracts. But, but that is also very, very time consuming and very demanding. And I wonder whether, and then I speak for Europe, whether our European societies find this word, the investigation. But that's my final word. I think it's more than word, the investigation. And, but it's a kind of energy that I don't see, no? uh, not in the training, not in the legal practice, not in the parliaments. Maybe the researchers should take their responsibility. I hope, Roberto, that it was more or less, not as, well, a kind of retrospection. Yeah. Well, I think that would be absolutely inappropriate to add anything to the uh, final remarks by Marie Claire and also to the final remarks by the end of, uh, of the session by uh, the chairman who uh, chaired in a perfect way. I would just like to say to all of you uh, that this is the, the website 
of the research project jurisdiction and pluralisms uh, within uh, the framework of which we have organized this seminar. Uh, well, I don't have time now to talk more about it, but I'll send you the coordinates so that you can explore a little bit what we have uh, done so far and what we're going to do in the future. Now, I hope that the very brilliant and very uh, deep analysis and the brightness of the discussion will eventually uh, give the possibility of having a volume. Uh, my first request, but of course David and I will send you an email, would be uh, possibly to exchange the slides or the draft text that uh, have been prepared. I think it may be very useful for all of us who participated to the uh, proceedings to uh, refresh our memories of the discussion and of course of the very precious inputs that have been uh, given. If you would agree, we might even put the slides, uh, perhaps not the papers, but the slides uh, available on the internet, but otherwise we'll keep them for ourselves. And then I think it would be most appropriate to, 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 to publish a, a book out of this conference. Uh, and of course, we all say that this should be very quickly, but I think, uh, and of course it will take some time, but I think that, uh, um, there is an ongoing uh, discussion. There is, as Marie-Claire has so brilliantly said, there is a need to invest and in, in, in such topics. And uh, uh, it seems that the academy is the uh, most appropriate body that can uh, invest and, and lead the way, uh, which then will have a number of consequences in the training of judges, in the training of attorneys, and I would say also in the training of public opinion in order to understand that sometimes, as was said earlier, even clashes may be a sort of conversation because it, it, it clashes uh, show that you are aware that there is uh, somebody who is other than you and you have to cope with that uh, particular presence. Uh, I don't want to end uh, this conference without thanking also, those who made it possible, in particular, Georgia Sartori, who is not here, but she took uh, care of lodging and meals and, and transportation. And of course, the students, the law students, you're here and there are two more out there. Uh, you've been very precious and, and I would say very efficient. So thank you very much. And make sure that all those students that have been involved in the organization of this conference will receive our words of gratitude. So thank you very much again. Uh, I had great expectations, and I mentioned that already. The expectations have uh, really been more than satisfied, and that's why I think that we should continue. If it is a club, Michele, uh, it's, uh, it's a club in which everybody here is a honorary member. Thank you again, and have a <laughs> nice, tra nice travel back home. <laughs>